Curitata, everybody. Uh, Bruce Harrell's my name. I'm the director of the Goodfellow Unit, and it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Cherie Johnston, Johnson tonight. Uh, she's a registered psychologist in Australia, and she runs an organization called Coaching for Doctors. So it's my great pleasure to hand over to Cherie, who will talk for a little while, and then there'll be a Q&A session. So Cherie, over to you. Thanks so much, Bruce, for uh, welcoming me tonight and welcome everybody. Hello. I'm just going to share my screen. As Bruce said, I am a psychologist. I'm also a registered uh, accredited coach with the International Coaching Foundation and a meditation teacher and an author. I'm going to be talking tonight with you about coaching. But before I do that, I just want to uh, recognise our First Nations people uh, here in Australia where I am. You can see this arrow down the bottom. I'm right down on the bottom southeast of Australia uh, on Gunai Kurnai country. Uh, I didn't grow up here. I grew up, I'll just use my arrow, I grew up in that little green dot there on the north of Victoria on the Murray River on Yorta Yorta country. So uh, I want to acknowledge and pay my respects to any First Nation elders people who are here today, to their ancestors and to the emerging leaders. We remain at Coaching for Doctors committed to listening, learning, growing and being together on what always was and always will be Aboriginal land that's never been ceded. And I'd just like to invite you to take 10 or 15 seconds to really feel the ground that you stand on and to uh, remember those who've come before us and to uh, think of those who come in front of us. Just really bring yourself to be present in the room in this conversation about coaching. And whilst you're doing that, you might just take a few moments to ask yourself, why are you here? A very coaching kind of question. Uh, and what would make this time really meaningful to you? I hope that uh, either in some of what I share in the next 25 minutes talking or in the conversation with Bruce afterwards, there will be time then for questions to really um, offer you something to take away that is really meaningful and useful to you in your work in health. Um, and perhaps it's a good time to say thank you for the work that you're doing and certainly under the pump at the moment. Very often when I start talking with people about coaching, uh, people say that I'm um, only working with individuals and that that's not going to make enough difference uh, to the health system. So I really invite you tonight to think about uh, both and or and both, whichever way works for you. We're really thinking about individuals who have a big impact on the system and the system's impact on individuals when we're thinking about coaching. Coaching is always contextual. So we are working often with an individual or a small group of people, sometimes a team of people. Uh, and we're also considering how uh, their uh, skills and, and the work that they're doing impacts the system and how the system is impacting them. Uh, I wrote a white paper at the beginning of last year and I uh, was really trying to articulate the benefits or the offering that coaching might have for healthcare. Uh, you can see the link on the bottom of this slide telling you where you can find that for free if you want to go to the Coaching for Doctors website and download it. But my, um, my intention or my point really is to say that if our workforce is suffering or if our workforce is well, that influences every other measure in health that we are working within a system and there are cycles of, of uh, success and cycles of downward spirals where things are going wrong. So I really just want to say that my interest is in working with people, individuals and groups of people, uh, healthcare workers, principally doctors, uh, sometimes healthcare leaders and occasionally uh, nurses and, and allied health people. Um, but my intention or my understanding when I'm doing that work, whoever I'm working with always is that if the workers are not well, they're not able to perform at optimum levels and everything else is affected as a result. So just to, um, I guess, put that on the table from the beginning. So the central question for tonight is what is professional coaching? I'm going to endeavour to try and give you some sense of what that is and how it differs from other things that we might do. And uh, then think about why or when would a person uh, seek professional coaching and what impact that might have in terms of healthcare. I've been uh, working as a psychologist for about 30 years. Uh, I had a long time um, counselling practice uh, where I was offering therapy to everybody except for people who were having active psychosis. Uh, and for the last eight years, I've been really uh, just developing my skills in a very niche place, uh, specifically coaching for doctors, as I said. 
So what is this thing co called coaching? It's different to all of the things that you can see on the screen. I'm going to show you a very short video now. It goes for about three and a half minutes. It doesn't have any sound for the first 15 or 20 seconds, so please don't um, panic. The system is still working and the sound will, will get going. Um, and then we'll, we'll come back to these words and see if we can differentiate coaching from these other activities that you probably have some sense of already. So here we go with the movie, the short video. Okay, so I wonder if you can, uh, Bruce, whether people can put some comments in the Q&A about what they noticed out of that video. What did it look like uh, coaching was uh, all about? A couple of key messages there that we'll be looking for. We've got collaboration. I can read them out to you. Providing tools to overcome challenges, giving others the tools, shared problem solving, uh, action plan, giving tools to achieve, empowering that's terrific. I think the really important thing that we want to notice about coaching is that it is a co-created process between the coach and the coachee. The coachee is really bringing their content and the coach is bringing a process and together they're looking to create different thinking, to uh, develop insight, to see something they haven't seen before and it's a very much a skill building process. So uh, it's not the coach doing the work for the coachee and it's certainly not training many people who come to coaching think that the coach is just going to sort of download some curriculum to them or have a, a ordinary um, level one level two level three kind of process that we're going to work through now sometimes the coach is offering resources and skills as we saw in the video but it's not the same as you can see their facilita facilitation or training where we're teaching a set curriculum with expected learned outcomes we, we don't know as coaches necessarily what the coach is going to to bring or where their priority is going to lie. So it's co-created between the two of them. It's very hard to determine the difference sometimes between counselling or therapy and coaching. I think certainly uh, counselling and therapy is looking to re relieve some kind of distress. Some people who come to coaching are not distressed at all. Uh, they're very um, ambitious or they're very focused. For instance, they might be looking uh, to improve their interview or their exam technique. They might have some clear options or decisions to make in front of them, but they don't necessarily see it as a distressing thing or as a problem. It's something that they're working through and trying to resolve. They're looking for a sounding board space. They're looking for someone to hold a mirror up. They're looking to create some more accountability, but they're not necessarily uh, distressed or with what they might call a, a, a painful problem that they don't know how to resolve. Sometimes they are. So there's this sort of big grey area between counselling and coaching. I think counselling is much more interested in, um, if you like, digging around in the past than coaching is. Coaching is a very forward-focused skill-building process. If we go down the list a bit more and we look at consulting, and I'm not talking about the patient consulting that you many of you do. I'm talking about a consultant coming into the organisation and looking at what's going on. In that case, we're uh, recommending a course of action. Uh, in coaching, we're very rarely recommending a particular course of action. We might be exploring the various courses of action. Um, we might be helping the coachee uh, determine which one has more likelihood of success or which one meets their values more successfully. But in the uh, certainly in the ideal world, the intention of coaching is not to direct or recommend or decide uh, the course of action. Some people who've worked for a very long time with their coach where the trust is very, very high, may have a little bit more of that in the relationship. But if we're talking about pure coaching, we're not looking for the coach to make any particular recommendations or encourage anyone up any particular road. Which brings us to mentoring. Mentoring and coaching often go hand in hand and sometimes coaches do also work as mentors. So we need to be very clear about our role differentiation. Uh, in mentoring, usually the person has already walked up that road. They're not necessarily in the same profession. For instance, um, somebody from a different industry might be your mentor as a leader in terms of learning about leadership. But a mentor is usually much freer with saying, this is what I did. If I were you, this is what I think you should do. And certainly um, there's often some sharing of the network. So a mentor who's walked the road before you 
might introduce you, for instance, to other people who uh, would be helpful to you in your development or in achieving your goals. Again, that can happen in coaching, but there needs to be a contracting conversation where it's very clear about the purpose of that. The person wouldn't usually come to coaching to coaching as a means of accessing the coach's network in the same way that they might for a mentor. And in supervision, uh, the person who's providing the supervision has some responsibility usually for the decisions and uh, the buck stops with them often. Uh, that's not the case in coaching. And there are some small variations between internal and external coaches in this way. So an internal coach would be employed by the organisation that the coachee works for, and they're both employees of the same organisation working inside the organisation. An external coach would be uh, somebody who is employed by a different organisation and who the, um, the person goes out to see or perhaps the coach comes to visit, but they don't uh, work for the same uh, body. So hopefully this definition, these definitions have uh, helped us some way along. I'm sure there'll be some questions uh, at the end, but trying to differentiate what is coaching compared to these other things that we already engage in. I want to just draw some attention to health coaching, just to be very clear that I'm not talking specifically about health coaching tonight. Health coaching is uh, using a lot of the same principles. They're both, uh, both professional uh, work-based coaching like I'm doing, or sometimes called organisational coaching. Um, and health coaching are using the same principles, the same tools, uh, but health coaching is very specifically walking beside someone uh, on a health issue. We're seeing more and more health coaches in Australia and in New Zealand, and you can see some of the organisations there on the slide if you're interested to uh, follow that up some more. I think in future we'll probably see health coaches in almost all clinics, perhaps in hospitals too, and their work uh, will principally be with people around chronic health issues. Um, we already see a lot of health coaching. We've seen it actually for years with places like Jenny Craig and so on, helping people to lose weight, weight watchers and so on. That's not what I'm talking about tonight, although often the coaching that I'm doing does have a well-being impact and many uh, healthcare professionals do come to coaching with uh, coaches like me uh, to improve their well-being. So a professional coach, please don't worry about these all these words too much. You can go on to any of these uh, sites. To th These words are lifted off the coaching organisation sites. Um, coaching is an unregulated organisation. So unlike, um, say, uh, psychology, where we need to be registered uh, with a, a board in our respective countries, um, coaching has no particular uh, registration or, or legal um, structure around it. Anybody can hang up their shingle and say that they're a coach. So I put this uh, slide here as a part of uh, really encouraging you to make sure you do your due diligence. Uh, a coach who is uh, trained and credentialed with one of these organisations has done uh, many hours of practice, has had supervision and has had specific training as the kind that Bruce was referring to earlier around what, what coaching is and how to be an effective coach. Uh, the, I'm a, mem I'm a uh, member of the International Coaching Federation. Any of these three organisations uh, will, will hold great ethical standards and guidelines and are really working very hard to try and bring some standard um, of practice to the coaching industry. So if you're looking for a coach, a great place to start is to ask the coach, um, are they credentialed with one of these organisations? And uh, how much experience do they have? You might want to ask them what level of training they're at. Uh, and some of the new coaches who have, um, are at the, that first level are actually excellent because they're you know, really engaged with the ethical practice and they're, they're currently in training. I'm sure that you will have seen some of this with um, some of the registrars and the students that you work with that they, um, some of them are so up to date and fresh and keen that they make terrific um, coaches. So we don't want to talk about it just in terms of some sort of ageist way, but we do want to understand what their training is and what their experience is. So uh, I've got two or three slides here. I'm sorry about all the words, but trying to really get at what, what is professional coaching. So certainly that first one that I've been talking about now, uh, you're talking with your coach about the rules, the ethics and the agreements. There's a constant contracting going on with your coach. So before you sign up and pay any money, you'll be discussing um, how many sessions you're going to have, how long they would go for, what the confidentiality rules are around it, who's keeping the notes, where are the notes, those kinds of things. Uh, and then in every session, you, would, you can expect your coach to be saying, um, 
can we just revisit the contract? Is what we've named as the goals before still the most important thing? Uh, if you bring three or four things to coaching, the co you can expect your coach to say things to you like, so what seems most important here? What's the thing we should really focus on today? So this kind of um, contracting agreement is going on all of the time as part of the co-creating and the equality that goes on in a coaching relationship. The coach is working really hard to create a very safe space because um, coaching is really built on the key qualities of high trust, high candor and action. So uh, many people come to coaching, they know what they want to do, they have a plan already, but they're not able to inaction it. And they say things like, I just really need an accountability buddy. I feel fairly clear, but uh, something's limiting me, something's stopping me. Will you um, hold the mirror up and keep me accountable so that I can progress this intention? So as I've said before, coaching is future focused, it's goal oriented, it's skill building, its intention is to create insight, to change or find different thinking or new thinking and, and with the goal of improving the individual circumstance and very often the collective uh, around that individual via or through that individual. So we can put the work under three headings, if you like, under performance, development, relationship and well-being. Uh, but it is adaptive and emergent and it is culturally cognizant. So as the relationship develops, uh, the goals become clear and new things emerge and so on. So I think I've covered most of these things, giving you just giving you some ideas about when people might come, health professionals, clinicians might come for professional coaching, certainly to improve or accelerate their performance, to improve their well-being. Often it's around some of the, the mind management, some of the imposter syndrome or growing self-awareness, um, establishing what are my values. I feel a bit confused. I came into my, my um, career with these values, but I'm not able to express them in this organisation or in this context. I'm having some conflict about that. Um, accountability and boundaries around career decisions and transitions and certainly around leadership development. The, the foundational skill of an effective leader is self-awareness. And in order to achieve that, we really need reflective practice. Uh, and many health professionals uh, understand reflective practice. Their aim and intention is to have reflective practice, but they don't have a structure or a mechanism that helps them to make it happen. And so they will arrive at coaching saying, it just never happens. I know the benefit of it, but I don't know how to fit it in or when to do it. And if they uh, build a relationship over time with the coach and they see the coach, for instance, for an hour every month, then there's a time and place where they do give priority to uh, this kind of reflection. So a last one of these, just to try and summarise, coaching is a safe space, sounding board, a place for experimental thinking. Uh, it allows a lot of reflection for the coach to find their own way to experiment out loud with their thinking, to create some headspace where there's no blame, gaming or shame, there's no judgement. Uh, and it's a process that can really help us move from good to great. So people are coming to coaching sometimes with a problem, sometimes quite distressed or not sure about their problem. Other times they're coming well developed in, in their intention and their work and really looking to amplify or uh, improve the level of excellence that they're able to achieve. So uh, medical culture and perhaps to lesser extent some of our other uh, health professions, but certainly medical culture does really well at teaching these skills on the, uh, these attitudes and skills and behaviours on the left hand side of this slide. It doesn't do as well with some of the things in the right hand side of this uh, slide. And many of our programs at Coaching for Doctors, uh, particularly our group programs, are focused on some of these skills in the right hand side. So I'm just again trying to help uh, articulate or bring some words, help you think about when and how uh, coaching might be of value for you. It's probably not true to say that every single person needs a coach, uh, I, although I do think, and I'm biased clearly, um, there is value to be gained for every person in coaching because of the reflective nature, the high trust nature. And this uh, challenge in seeing ourselves is very hard to really see ourselves and uncover our own assumptions uh, and being in a safe space with a trusted person who's skilled at asking um, uh, questions differently uh, allows us to, to do that kind of discovery. When we develop our intra, our care of self and our internal world, our self-awareness skills, 
and our interpersonal skills, our skills with other people in relationship, uh, we are able to be more well more of the time. And we know that well practitioners, well clinicians uh, achieve better health outcomes with their patients. We also um, see some some research, and I think it's pretty clear uh, anecdotally, around uh, well health professionals feeling more satisfied, fulfilled, balanced, uh, feeling like they can get some of that work-life balance happening at least some of the time. And to me, that really is very clear that that makes our careers much more sustainable than that kind of barely surviving, uh, reacting from one thing to the next uh, existence in healthcare. These skills of intra and interpersonal skills are protective. They help us manage and care for our own mental health. And I think it's fair to say that they probably prevent burnout. Pretty hard to measure. And uh, as you understand, the research can take a long time before we can really say a very uh, clear statement about that. Professional coaching is grounded in psychology. Many uh, professional coaches are psychologists, though not all. And uh, more and more doctors are going to uh, train and learn about coaching so that they can uh, coach their peers and others. There is definitely some merit in peer-to-peer uh, -peer coaching and uh, people having an understanding of the industry. Uh, there is also some traps in that space because uh, it's easy to fall into those other roles of being supervisor um, or a uh, a mentor or saying when I was in that experience or this is what I would do. A person like me who's a psychologist who sits outside of medicine hasn't been uh, indoctrinated or enculturated into um, you know, all, the, all the ways of medicine. And so sometimes we can see more clearly. But I think that the, you know, we're still testing all of that because coaching is pretty new to healthcare. Certainly there are many nurse coaches and doctor coaches in America, a few in uh, Europe and, and the UK, and it's a, a burgeoning um, industry in New Zealand and Australia. One of the reasons that uh, psychologists are very interested in coaching is because coaching is about motivation and future focus. Psychologists are very interested uh, inherently in motivation. And so we're, we're thinking all the time in our work around this top-down functions. How does our brain, what does our thinking and our planning and so on do to our behaviour and our experience of the world? We're also thinking about the outside in the context. What does the context do to us uh, in terms of our thinking and our emotions and our experience? And what happens from our limbic system when, when we're hijacked by our amygdala or our, our assumptions, our unconscious bias uh, gets in the way of our behaviour. All of these things are relevant to coaching. And just as a kind of little aside, Sarah McKay, uh, Dr. Sarah McKay, she's a neuroscientist, um, has a neuroscience academy. And I want to really highly recommend her, her programs to you. If you're interested in the neuroscience of behaviour, um, I really encourage you to have a look at the neuroscience academy and what she's offering in terms of education. Uh, coaching it has a very sound base in positive psychology, but that's not the only theoretical base. And so just to uh, name a number of um, uh, scientific bases that are underpinning coaching, I'm not going to talk about all of those tonight, but just to say the work in all of these areas uh, is very relevant to the work we're doing in coaching. So adults have three key psychological needs, safety, belonging and autonomy. All of these have been tested during the pandemic, but they're tested just in our day-to-day -day life as, as adults living on planet Earth, uh, and they are all um, big topics in coaching. So if, if any of these seem relevant to you, uh, I do encourage you to think about coaching as a way to understand how you can improve or, or grow or um, meet your psychological needs of safety, belonging and autonomy. When we are working in a pandemic or in the healthcare system, even before the pandemic, there are very many things that can deplete us as adults. Uh, you, most of you will be familiar with the HALTS um, acronym. I always like to extend it and include a couple of extras. Uh, these, are the, the, these are the things that describe a person who's depleted. And when we're depleted, we're uh, poorer decision makers. And really, my um, personal view is that we are incapable of providing optimal care, that probably the best we can do is provide suboptimal care. And I know that's not what any of us intend or want. Uh, and part of when you come to talk to a coach about whether coaching is the right strategy for you, if you're experiencing any of this, is to try and sort out, should I be having some coaching? Should I be having some counselling? Do I need a holiday? What's the, what else do I need? So coaching 
um, sometimes is just helping you sort out what's going on. And sometimes the outcome can be, I need to go and have some therapy or some counselling. Uh, it is true to say that some of my uh, clients are having coaching and counselling at the same time with two different professionals. Uh, very often one or the other is suspended temporarily or for sometimes a longer time uh, so that the focus can be with one or other of those professionals. Having counselling doesn't stop you having coaching at the same time, but it really depends what your needs are and what you're working on. And it really depends on your mental health at any given time. If you're really not in a position to make decisions, you know, very burnt out, or very depressed, um, it's probably better to wait or suspend your coaching and come back to that after you've done a little bit of recovery. Uh, just a little reminder that as humans, we only have one reaction to stress. It doesn't mean uh, it doesn't matter if it's imagined, if it's just your perception, if you dreamt it, or if it's really happening in the moment. Physiologically, we only have one set, of one reaction. Our body, uh, our fight flight experience is the same, whatever's uh, the trigger, whatever the stressor is. And uh, it's, ca coaching can be stressful. Uh, it's a place of uh, growth and learning. It's not necessarily a place of, you know, somebody patting you back and saying, you know, you're doing a great job. Very often the coach is your number one cheerleader, uh, but sometimes they're also the person who's challenging you and testing your ideas and, as I said, holding the mirror up. So just to just as a note to say it's it um, can be stressful to come into coaching. I want to encourage uh, everybody to think about learning uh, by itself can be stressful and it's up to you and your coach to have this conversation about um, how that's going and, and how that's meeting your needs and when to pull back or when to lean in a bit more. So working in healthcare is a very particular kind of work. Uh, coaching has been uh, operating in corporate spaces for 30 years. There's a lot of research for uh, its um, impact and value in helping people learn and grow and develop. Uh, it, I don't have any doubts personally about that. There's reams of research if you want to read it. It's quite new in healthcare. And one of the things I think uh, is happening, in, at least in, with the doctors that I'm working with in coaching, is this challenge to some of the, the guiding principles in medicine. Patients first and do no harm exist for very good ethical reasons. And I'm certainly not here to challenge them in terms of um, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But I am here to say that if we continually value these two without something else in the mix, we're potentially or we're implying that providers of care are second. I don't think that's satisfactory. Uh, it's certainly not satisfactory with the current state of our healthcare services. And so I think we need to really think very deeply about this. If we are simply responding to patient first all of the time without questioning that, without thinking more about that, then uh, you know the, the demand is endless. And I think that's a recipe for burning out uh, health professionals. And in that state, I don't think that we're actually very good at deciding what is doing harm and what isn't doing harm. My proposition is that we be much more um, overt about saying that we need to have safety first as our foundational principle. And some of this kind of conversation can happen in coaching. Uh, in group coaching, a lot of this happens. And in team coaching, it can happen even more. There's not very many teams that I'm aware of in healthcare really actively seeking to do coaching together. Sometimes leadership teams are doing it, as in the executive team of an organisation. But I think we've got a long way to go in, in terms of um, really taking these kinds of concepts into groups and really uh, coaching around how we can change the culture of healthcare by thinking and looking at these principles. I could talk about this all night. I'm not going to. I just want to give you some flavour for how coaching can extend out beyond the individual. Christina Maslach and her colleague, Michael Lita, who have been researching burnout for a long time, say that these are the six causes of burnout. There's a couple of things here that are pretty structural and hard uh, to get at unless the coach is working with the, the decision makers, the, the executive team and so on, the policy makers. But there are a number of things here that can happen in coaching. The coaching, the alter, the changes that can happen out of coaching are sometimes all internal, purely a reframing and uh, uh, doing some work on values and so on inside the person who's the coachee. Other times, uh, it's actively making different behaviour and different decisions. So, for instance, deciding not to work in that organisation anymore. 
Most of the people I work with are self-referred. They're often claiming CME from their hospital for their coaching. Other people might be paying, but the people who are initiating the coaching themselves, sometimes, not, not as often, sometimes an organisation will seek a coaching for a person and sometimes they're involved in the contract. So we have a three-way contract. It's always very important that the coach makes it incredibly clear to any employing organisation that might be paying for and setting up the coaching that the coaching is confidential with the coachee, that there won't be any reporting by the coach to the organisation, and that the coach makes no undertaking to do any management uh, to the extent of making sure the person stays at that workplace. The coaching is for the coachee. If the coach, if the organisation wants to pay for it and uh, wants to name some goals that they hope might be relevant to the coaching, that's all fine. Uh, and the coach will likely encourage the coachee to share what they're learning and the development they're doing with their employer or their manager. Uh, but the coach will never be reporting the outcomes or the activity of the coaching inside the coaching arrangement because it affects the confidentiality and the work too much. So I hope that gives you also some thinking about how um, the relationship works when an organisation employs a coach. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is that coaching is really about an attempt to make sense of the world, about how to understand our perception and how to marry up what we want in, in our work or in our life with what the reality is around us. Our experiences come from what's inside us and what's outside of us, and nobody's reality is the same as somebody else's reality. So when we're trying to make sense of the world, um, we endeavour to make sense of somebody else if they're relevant to us. If they're not relevant to us, it doesn't really matter. We don't need to make sense of them. But if they're relevant to us, if we need to have an ongoing relationship with them, if we want to work effectively with them, then we need to try and make sense with them, a sense of them. And we do this by being curious, asking a lot of questions. And that, to some extent, is the kind of um, centre of coaching. The coach is curious. The coach is uh, pulling the coachee up on their language, on their self-limiting statements. They're asking questions like, where did you get that idea from? How long have you been working with that idea? What would be another possible story? Uh, so we're really very curious people. Uh, we do ask a lot of questions. And we're really inviting the coachee to do the same, to challenge their own thinking, to challenge what's their experience. Um, if we don't ask questions and we're not curious, the question then becomes, how else can we figure out what's going on? I don't know if anybody wants to put into the chat for Bruce, you know, how, how do we figure out what's going on if we don't ask a person what's their experience, what's the story, what, what's happening for them? How do we figure it out? And just in the interest of having conversation and putting the slides down, the answer is we make up a story. And very often we make up a faulty story, a story that's not actually true because we don't have all the information and because our reality is not the same as anybody else's reality. And coaching really unearths that and, and finds these mistakes, these cognitive traps that we fall into. So just to encourage you to be curious, giving you some ideas about how to be curious, um, my um, simplest thing is uh, ask, don't tell, and then uh, try and take why out of your conversation and ask some what and how questions. And I've given you some examples there for what you might do. So for your own interest, just to do a little bit of self-coaching after the conversation tonight, you might want to start uh, noticing the questions that you ask yourself and try and turn them into some what and how questions and see what you can discover. Uh, as Bruce said, I've written a book. It's called The Thriving Doctor. Uh, the link is here, and I think Paul's going to put it in the chat too when I put the slides down. Uh, if you're in New Zealand and you want to buy the book, the easiest way is on Booktopia or Amazon. Uh, and we have sold uh, a number of uh, bulk deliveries into New Zealand to particular organisations, which has been fabulous. Thank you very much for your um, keenness to really develop this work. Uh, so if you're looking to make a bulk order of books, please do send me an email and we'll help you with the uh, the price and all of that. Uh, so all my contacts are there. I think Bruce will share them afterwards and certainly feel free to send me an email. I'm very keen to carry on the conversation with you. So well, let's say I, I, I think I need some, oops, hang on. I think I need some coaching. So and I contact you actually like I did and you said, well, I can meet you for half an hour. So could you walk me through what the steps are and then you offer group courses, online courses, 
and a bunch of other things that I think the audience would be quite interested. I was thinking some of our young doctors and training nurses and training might like to do some of your online courses because they're quite reasonably priced, I think, aren't they? And um, well, there's a range of things. So hopefully there's a, a you know, a, a point that meets everybody's needs. So in terms of the half hour complimentary conversation, the process is to go onto the website. Uh, I think it's under the about tab and you'll, people will be able to find a spot there that they can book a complimentary phone call. So um, because you're in New Zealand and I'm in Australia, we do those phone calls on WhatsApp. So hopefully most people can uh, work with that medium. We can also do it on Zoom, but as a general rule, that first conversation is a phone call. And really that's for people to ask me whatever they want to ask me, uh, in, in particularly around uh, doing work with us. I don't really want people to just ring me up and have a chat about, you know, <laughs> what's on Netflix. I haven't got time for those kinds of leisurely conversations during the week. But if people want to talk to me about coaching, how they can join our group programs, um, whether they uh, whether their, their needs are appropriate for coaching, those kinds of things, I'm very happy to have those conversations. There's really no rules. It's essentially how can I help you? What would you like to know? Um, and if people do then want to go on to uh, having some coaching or um, any kind of joining our group programs, then we send the, the appropriate links and set up a contract and go from there. So, um, so, we, so do, we, do you ever get people who are very clear about what they want and you say, okay, you need coaching, we'll book you in, or do you always have a little bit and that's all free, isn't it? You don't charge for that. Is that half, half an hour complimentary? Absolutely. It's kind of a chemistry check. It's good for us to have a conversation in case, um, you know, we just don't fit together very well in some way. So I usually do encourage people to have a conversation with me first. You can, in theory, click on the website and, and track the process through to say, yes, I want to start. I'm ready to go kind of thing. Um, but we probably would at least have some emailing back and forward to establish what your goals were or what you were wanting to achieve out of that before we proceeded. I think it's, um, as I said, it's a very high trust relationship. It does require uh, some willingness to be confronted or challenged during the process. Uh, and so it's important or better if we have um, had a conversation together first. So there's a question here, I guess it's the distinction between supervision and coaching. So the question is from Olive, my understanding of supervision is different to the one presented. Professional supervision is reflection on practice with the supervisee providing the agenda and taking responsibility for their actions following facilitated reflection. So um, would you agree with that? Um, and how would coaching differ from that? So, so is the question, how is uh, supervision different to coaching? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, in terms of the supervision I have as a psychologist, at least, I am bringing uh, my difficult cases or my uh, challenging experiences in terms of transference or projection or um, something that's been confronting for me at work or whatever, and, and talking about those with my supervisor as part of uh, taking good care of the patient and taking good care of me. So coaching is similar in the sense that it's looking to take good care of the coachee and, and uh, to make sure that or help that person be uh, useful to their patients as well. But it doesn't have the same um, regulatory requirements requirements, if you like. So as a psychologist, I need to see a supervisor. That's part of my maintaining my registration. Uh, coaching is not in, in that basket. There are The reflective practice would be similar in both places, but the supervisor has more, as, as I think your questioner pointed out, the supervisor has more um, control and more responsibility than uh, in the coaching. The coaching process creates different thinking because of the equality. There's no power differential in that in that relationship. And also, uh, one of the things I found quite exciting in the coaching course that uh, you suggested I do um, was at the asking of open-ended questions. And um, I, I because we, we do that with medical students, get them to ask open-ended questions. But in the coaching model, that's to stretch the the well coachy or counterpart um, stretch their options I guess isn't it yes and I wonder if you'd just like to say a few words about that yeah I think um the course that you're doing they have a terrific exercise around open questions um 
open open questions really are difficult and we assume as we become more experienced practitioners that we're open we're asking a lot of open questions but we actually usually become very narrow and ask the same set of questions over and over and over again and if people who are taking histories in health will know that they've got a very sort of rhythmic kind of pattern after a while about how they probably do that if anybody's giving you a single answer, so not necessarily yes or good, but it might be like all right or don't know or those kind of one or two word answers, then the questions are closed. And um, in the interest of time, we very often revert to closed questions without realising it because we're trying to get the answers that we need to make a diagnosis and, and move on in health because it's just too much work and too much time pressure and too many patients. <laughs> Um, I think the experience of coming into coaching and asking open questions is that we are intentionally creating more time and space for that. We are um, uh, seeking to uncover or create or develop new thinking that we haven't experienced or thought of before. We're actually intentionally wondering how can we find a new insight? What would happen if... So we, we are exploring even the questions often are new. We haven't asked or thought of that question before. And so um, I, I think that part of why we do well with open questions in coaching is because we've got this time. Now, I'm, I'm talking as if we've always got an hour. Sometimes we do laser coaching for 15 minutes. Sometimes we do hallway coaching. But we're not providing any answers. It's always ask, don't tell is our kind of starting point. Not sure if I'm getting it at the, the point of the question, Bruce. Okay. Uh, we've got some more questions along that line. Um, so we've got a question from... Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for the clarification. Psychologist supervision, supervision obviously has more of an account accountability and mentoring nature. Would that be... Yeah, I think, yeah I think that's fair to say. Yeah, I think just uh, getting these distinctions, uh, okay. And so there's a, I am a professional supervisor and doctor in, in New Zealand. I think that what she has described as coaching is commonly called professional supervision. This is distinct from inline supervision or case discussion. No. I'm not quite sure I fully understand the question. So, certainly, I would say when I did my coach training nine or so years ago, um, we were taught that there was a very clear boundary between all of these things. I think that coaching uh, evolution, if you like, in terms of it's the research that goes on in coaching in psychology and in other places um, is saying that the lines are much more blurred than, than perhaps we first described them to be. So uh, much of what we do in coaching, I think, would definitely fall under the benefit of the banner of professional supervision, but it doesn't have the same um, registration requirements, which is why anybody can hang up their shingle and say that they're a coach. So I think uh, I, have a, I have a professional bias. I think that psychologists, there's so much psychology underpinning coaching that psychologists have a head start. And that's my experience as a psychologist. Uh, but I think there is also scope for doctors, nurses and others to be good coaches too. But we And, and that diversity will do coaching well. And I do want to encourage those listening to think about a coach inside your own profession, but also to think about a coach outside your profession. And, and that will be a distinction in terms of professional supervision usually too. Okay. So how the question from Miriam here, how long would a coach coachy relationship usually last? I appreciate this will vary. Yes. How long is a piece of string? Um, yeah. uh, it varies a lot. Uh, I ask the people that I work with to sign up for six sessions because it is developmental. So um, uh, you can't really come for one session when we don't know each other. After they've had those six sessions, sometimes they'll go away. They might ring me an, a year later and say, can I just come for one session? I've got a particular problem that I'm trying to resolve. And because we already have a relationship, we can do that. Uh, many people come to our group programs and do six months. So they have six coaching sessions and, and six group sessions as well. Uh, and then they might do another six sessions of coaching on their own, for instance. The reverse also happens where people have been doing 
six coaching sessions and then they say, now I'm ready to come into the group program. Um, I'm working with a professor who uh, recently told me that he, he was going to keep coaching for the rest of his working life. He has the session once a month. He's been working with me for a couple of three years. He has found it so useful. He thinks it would be stupid to stop was his words. So I think, you know, it really depends on what you're bringing into the conversation in terms of goals and intention and the skills that you're looking to build and the relationship that you build with the coach. And, and probably the third part of what you do with that, when you build these skills and you build this relationship in coaching, what do you then, what action do you then take when you go out of the coaching? So uh, the people I work with come and go, come for a long time, come for a short time, you know, we're all different. So could you just, um, with these, these group things you do now, they'll be available online so people from New Zealand could do them. Yes, they can. Uh, do you do any face-to-face -face group work or is it all online now? We have scheduled, uh, we have done lots of face-to-face -face work pre-pandemic and we have scheduled a, a group work session starting in February next year, so four Fridays for six hours each Friday, so the, those same people would come to Melbourne or be in Melbourne um, for four months in a row for those longer days. So we're starting, we're just starting, I guess, to put our toe back in the water in terms of face-to-face -face next year. We tried this year to get some face-to-face -face going and people didn't register. They were still wanting to register for Zoom. So we decided we weren't, re people weren't ready to do that yet. And what sort of things do you do in those groups and how long do they last? And like, just, could you just describe, like I sign up for your group thing, what am I going to get and what, what's going to be expected of me? So, uh, so Recalibrate is our, um, our signature program. It's the most impactful thing we deliver. So uh, online, it looks like six masterclasses that go for four hours each. So we meet once a month on a Saturday morning for four hours. We obviously have a couple of breaks during that long time. Uh, it's a closed group, up to 10 doctors uh, working on, uh, it's a hybrid coaching program. So they have six individual coaching sessions during that six months at the, to fit in with their own roster as they can make that work. And then they have six masterclasses. In the masterclasses, we cover um, mindfulness, communication, uh, empathy and compassion, unconscious bias, um, emotions, and leadership and preventing burnout. So we provide some teaching, some content. We provide a lot of resources. We ask people to uh, commit to eight hours a month. So four hours in the masterclass, one hour in coaching, and three hours to write their journal, uh, read, watch some things, uh, we have they have a they have their own closed WhatsApp group, so they're talking to each other about the resources and the learning. Um, and there is some teaching in the masterclasses, but there's quite a lot of uh, breakout room work and experiential work. So we're really looking in that program to um, uh, embed the skills in the day to day practice. And and the um, we we've had about three people. Uh, we've run the group seven times over the last five years. We've had we're having. We look like we'll have five or six groups next year. It's having such success and we've got enough data now to, to demonstrate what's happening. We've had about three people have to pull out during the course of the groups. So um, all the people who graduated, so most people have graduated, 100% of those people have said this program should be compulsory for all doctors. It's a very powerful program. The combination of peer support and peer work and peer testing of the ideas uh, and the, the space to come individually and then say, I don't get this bit or this bit really resonated with me or I took that out and I, I used it at work and this is what happened. This combination of individual coaching and testing and the peer um, discussion and, and sharing it is incredibly powerful. We, we're very excited about it. We wish we could um, magically give it to everybody tomorrow. <laughs> but so we what, are what level of people are coming in? Are these sort of junior trainees, senior mm. trainees, mm. Uh, consultants early in their career, consultants later in their career? We, uh, we, I'm trying to generalise it a bit to uh, nurses and pharmacists as well, we, like where they are. We had a lot of requests from the other professions to provide for them too, and we, we do hope perhaps in the future to do that, but we're, we're just not there yet in terms of our own learning. But so uh, one of the things that we've have, uh, I would say everybody comes, we have had people from almost every uh, uh, medical college through the, those seven groups. Um, and we've had people from every state. We have just this year our first New Zealander in the program. So we're very excited about that. Uh, but um, 
we have had a number of junior doctors who find it very difficult to get to the masterclasses. So it's becoming more and more evident that um, it's, it's the advanced trainees and the mid-career people that are getting the, the most benefit. We do have some people in later stage of career in Recalibrate who are saying, I wished I'd, I wished I'd had something like this much earlier. So um, what we're finding with the junior doctors is they don't have enough control over their roster as a general statement. Uh, to lock in the masterclasses where we can have um, junior doctors. We've had a couple of junior doctors sponsored by their department to come to the program and they have been able to make sure their roster fits and can come to the six masterclasses. But where they don't have, um, you know, clear support from their leader, it's very difficult. For instance, we've got somebody in our next, the next masterclass that's due on in a fortnight. Um, the whole team around them is going to a training, a different training session and they're the only person on deck. So there's no way that they can come to our masterclass. So um, we are learning over time that it is difficult, more difficult for the junior doctors to be able to commit to that program. Um, as part of trying to attend to that, we have a new program just this year called The Thriving Doctor Applied that we're offering in uh, two hour blocks, but it's 12 two hour blocks on a Monday night in its sequence. Uh, and we had a lot of feedback from the junior doctors that that would work. We've, we've, ha we're having our second try at the moment to recruit to that program, and uh, we're finding it very difficult to get the juniors in there again. So we're we're really revisiting how and what we do to service the the younger those first five or six years um, at work for for our doctors. So we've got those two groups, the junior doctors and the uh, people who aren't doctors, the health professionals uh, that we would like to serve and help. Um, we just don't have capacity at the moment. We do have an on, a completely online program, $119, 12-month um, program, all fully recorded, no, no direct access with me, but all videos by me, all content written by me um, that we do try and encourage other healthcare providers to use. And some have had great success. We've had great feedback from people who use it. But again, people say we can't find time for it. So we, we like many of us, running into this continual problem of people saying we know this is a priority, we want to do it, we don't know how to fit it into our real life. And what's the name of that $119 course? It's called Respond. Respond. So there's Recalibrate and Respond. Okay. And something's called Flourish. And flourish. Okay, so there are, there are things there for people who aren't doctors they could yes. they could do. So yes. that's good. So what what sort of some of the issues they come in with? Are they am I in the wrong? Am I should should I be in healthcare or not? Or like well, what would be your top three perhaps problems that people would come to you with issues? Uh, you know, well, the most common one would be interesting to start with. Yes, it's, it's really hard to pin it down, Bruce, because people don't come with one problem, they come with multiple <laughs> multifaceted lives. Um, but certainly, I mean, uh, you know, it's a very broad brush thing, but many people come to say, I don't know how to do this work-life balance thing. And uh, the, the uh, manifestations of that are many, of course. So the problem, if you like, is my work-life balance is not okay. Uh, how that's showing itself is in lots of different ways. Um, uh, the the mid-career doctors are coming often with leadership issues because they've found themselves as head of department when they're not sure they want to be or um, uh, they are uh, resentful and um, fed up with having to uh, problem solve in areas that aren't perhaps their area of specialty or the area that they wanted to be in. Um, and, and the other one that's very common is feedback and that's from both ends. So Junior doctors saying, I've got this feedback, I don't know what it means and I don't know what to do with it. And senior doctors or mid, mid supervising doctors saying, um, I don't know how to give this feedback. I think I'll just give it to them when they're finished the term. And uh, me saying, well, is that the, you know, is that the best service that you can give this doctor that you're helping to learn? What do you need so that you could give the feedback to them earlier? And so learning a whole lot of things around communication, really, and being clear in our communication. I don't think medicine, and, and really, I'm not sure that psychology did a good job either when I was in my degree, which is a long time ago, um, in helping us really do that interpersonal communication with our colleagues. And certainly, um, many organisations have asked me to come and help their nurses in that regard. 
not the nurses themselves individually. So I'm not sure about the nuance in that, but organisations coming and saying, you know, our inter there are intergenerational problems in our nursing staff. We want to talk to you about that. No. Um, got a question from Banu. She asks, is the different programs available on the Thriving Doc website? Does it explain which ones are which? Uh, yes, uh, yes, we think it does, but sometimes people tell us that it's confusing and they <laughs> need some more information. So if that's the case, please email me or um, text me if you want to do that or, uh, or set up a half hour conversation with me. Okay, question from Sam. Presumably coaching isn't just about talking about problems, but ideas, strategies, plans as well. Totally. This is part, that's part of what differentiates it from clinical psychology intervention. Yes, I think uh, the co coaching at the um, the higher ends of the hierarchy, if you like, so where people are moving into leadership, transitioning into leadership, or leading teams, or uh, just ambitious to be effective in their in their leadership roles, um, it's very future focused. Much more about skill development and and stretch and leaning into um, you know what comes next. That's that's the uh, most exciting coaching from my point of view. Does this overlap with personal development? This, this sounds just specific to professional being a doctor, although personal things may come up. Is this incorporated or is it that when you would suggest counselling therapy? Uh, it depends on the level of distress and the emotional, the mental health of the person. So uh, I have a big background in, I uh, had my own counselling practice for many years. So my background is in trauma and grief and so on so I'm very comfortable with that space so I can work with the person through that stuff usually um, if if there's so for instance I had a doctor tell me one day that um, uh, there were two experiences when they worked in a Pacific Island country that really kept haunting them so we I said well let's work on that for this this particular just this session and if it feels unresolved or bigger than what we can manage here we'll we'll make a referral for counseling so we actually resolved what the issues were in the coaching and so she stayed in the coaching but, but yes I think personal development always affects professional development um, there's a lot of personal development work that goes on for instance uh, we do a lot of work around mindfulness and being present or compassion or um, emotional regulation or emotional intelligence. So those kinds of things affect every facet of our life. We can't really separate those. Yes, I had someone the other day who uh, was sort of saying yes to every request that was being made of her. And I suggest a little bit of assertiveness training. They have yeah. started to say no to a few things. Um, so how much of that would you do um, as part of your coaching? So if people were identifying that they, and many people do, um, perhaps perhaps more, more of the female doctors, um, uh, that I need to be more assertive or I need to say no. And, and again, it's a mid-career issue. Lots of people wanting to uh, stay, in, stay in, for instance, in Australia, stay in the public system because that aids their research. And, you know, there's many juggling balls. Um, so uh, now I've lost track of the question. Say the question to me again, Bruce. Um, it's oh, it's coming about assertiveness training, yeah. You know, yes. Um, so uh, from the from the coaching point of view, it might be that we have a conversation, do some role, re some rehearsal and some practice or identify who are the people or what are the circumstances that actually create this circumstance or limit the person's choices or stop them from saying yes or no, uh, saying no. What are they giving up by saying yes to this? Uh, what else do they miss out on as, as a result? If they identify, I need some training, then the coaching is, so where would you be able to find that and how will you make that happen? As opposed to me actually saying, you need to go and get some assertiveness training. Right, right, yep. Uh, question here from Nicola. Hello, Sheree. How do you describe mindfulness and its benefits to people who may not be particularly open to it, a bit <laughs> sceptical about how it might help them? Somebody struggling with anxiety and overwhelmed, convincing them about things like the power of the breath what is your pattern on this? <laughs> Hello, Nicola. Um, well, read my book would be one suggestion. But I think um, experience, experience is very powerful. And so, again, it depends on the context. If you're working with someone in your consulting room, that might be quite different to if you're you know, talking to you, your sister who's um, not interested really in listening to your advice. If I try and teach my children mindfulness, for instance, I can see them turning their ears off as soon as I yeah, mention There goes mum again. 
Um, so, you know, any opportunity to help a person take a deep breath. So uh, there was a very small example at the beginning of the session here where I said um, about the, the country that we are on and what's your intention. I put that slide up and I didn't use the word mindfulness, but I did invite everybody to take a moment to check their intention and why did they arrive today? So um, some very subtle things like that, but also being able to say, oftentimes I will start a meeting by saying, you know, or coaching if someone's clearly came rushing in and they're late um, and then maybe they couldn't make the Zoom work or whatever was happening, I might say, let's just both, let's put our feet on the floor and just take one nice long exhalation together. So actually helping people feel the difference in their body, our parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system will give us this information if we can create some spaces in some ways. And that's much more powerful than just trying to convince somebody. Um, certainly, uh, I, I was talking with a doctor earlier this morning who said, I think I need to know something about mindfulness, but I don't really know why or how it's relevant. I just know that people are talking about it all the time. And so um, I talked with them about uh, they, they love going out into nature. They've recently been swimming with the whales. And so I asked them about their experience of being with the whales and um, what happened, where was their focus, how present were they. And we talked about that. And then we brought those things back around to what happens in their work. And I always talk to people about informal and formal mindfulness. So informal mindfulness is this ability to be able to just take one long exhalation wherever they are, or to feel their feet on the floor, or to ground themselves in something that's really present. Um, and formal, formal mindfulness is things like meditation and yoga and sitting in practice. So I think if we give people room to uh, not have to, oh, God, I'm going to have to sit on the cushion every day for 10 minutes. I'm never going to do that. <laughs> Just give them room to bring mindfulness into their work in tiny little bits like, you know, when, when you're in between your patients, when you sit down, feel your feet on the floor and just remember that you're connected to the ground and gravity will hold you, whatever the next patient brings in. And so just finding these small ways to tap into um, inviting our nervous system to do its natural work if we can let it and we don't just get caught up in fight flight all the time. Yes, I had a patient once who was had a very strong religious belief and she felt like, mindfulness was buddhism and she couldn't do it she came back the following week still very very uptight so i said why don't you do i just put my ear pods in and just i gave her a john cabot zen 30 minutes and she came back and says that's the most relaxed i've been in years yes. so uh i won her over by experience so i think sometimes inviting people for the experience yes. um uh, so nicolo says thank you sheree very helpful response love your work was given a copy of your great book so there's a plug Thank you. Um, high praise from Caesar, I would say. It's a very good book, and I would recommend um, uh, getting a copy of it. So, um, um, so Luarel has asked, does, do you use meditation in your coaching? I find visualization and meditation helpful. And if you do, how do you do it? Mm -hmm. uh, only occasionally. If a, if a coach asked me to, if a coach said they wanted me to, I certainly would. Um, uh, we do in our masterclass program in Recalibrate, we're certainly uh, doing lots of uh, meditation practices in there of varying kinds and varying lengths. So one of the things we're trying to do in the group program is give people an experience of what it's like uh, for the reasons I just said, uh, answering Nicola's question, so they can actually feel their body. Many of us forget we have a body. We're just operating as if we're a head on a stick. So <laughs> helping people just reconnect to their body, feel their body, and in very simple ways. So things like feel your feet on the floor, um, take one long, slow out breath. The exhalation is the most important part. Um, it's the body's imperative isn't really to get oxygen. It's really to get rid of the carbon dioxide. So using some of that simple kind of science, if I'm talking to um, health professionals, they generally like a little bit of science. So um, rather than thinking about the religious part, talking about just the physiological experience, um, I don't use visualization very often. I do, I am a yoga nidra teacher and I do um, use visualization in some of my other work, but in coaching, I uh, tend to just stick with pretty simple mindful practices that focus on the breath and on feeling the body, the body scan, that kind of thing. Um, and it, this really needs to be driven by the, the coachee. So they all know that I'm a meditation teacher and that I practice mindfulness. Uh, and that's part of our conversation in terms of asking about their presence or what they're aware of. But I don't always use the word mindfulness because it doesn't suit everybody. Some people don't like it. So, 
Okay. So you've certainly got a lot, a lot of strings to your bow, Cherie. Um, so we, we've come to the end of questions. If you can wrap up, if you've got things you wanted to add, um, if you just want to, uh, maybe your website and just a summary of what you have to offer with your organisation. Thank you, Bruce. So uh, the website is coachingfordoctors.net.au, very easy to find. Um, in terms of one-on-one -on -one coaching, we are currently taking uh, new clients who would be working with me uh, for August. So um, if you wanted to have a conversation with me over the next two or three weeks, then you would be able to start pretty well straight away. If you're just wanting to have a conversation for some unknown future time, then uh, you can obviously book in any time. Uh, it, uh, the, the after hours times do book up. So that, that's something to think about in terms of New Zealand and Australian time. Um, the current We're currently recruiting for the junior doctor program. Uh, so uh, interns to four years out, the thriving doctor applied. Uh, you, if you're on social media or you're on, uh, or you can get on the website to see the information, the registration is closed on next Monday. Uh, and we do have a minimum of 15 people. So if we don't get 15 people enrolled, that group won't run. It's a live coaching program. We don't record our masterclasses or our live coaching programs because we are really invested in creating a safe space. Um, when we recruit for our masterclass program, we give everybody the um, list of who's attending six weeks beforehand so that people can self-select out if there are other people in the group they know. So we're really very invested in making safe space for people so that they can do work that they don't have really any other place that they can do it usually. In terms of the other health care practitioners, I just am so grateful for the work you do and I really wish that we could um, include you. My original vision was that it wouldn't be about doctors, it would be any healthcare profession in these uh, groups. But uh, the feedback we had from doctors was that they would like to be just with doctors. So we're still learning and experimenting. If anybody has any feedback or comment about what would work or whether there are culturally different things for New Zealand, I'm very, I'm, I'm all ears. I think we're, we're all learning about how to take better care of ourselves and each other. Okay, Cherie. Well, thank you very much for this evening. The audience seems to be getting lots of lots of praise in the chat box, mm -hmm. and um, and there's the book. Absolutely, a very good read. Highly recommend it. Um, so, thank you very much. Great that you've set up this organisation, and we hope um, that we can have coaching for all health professionals one day, and it will be just something we consider a natural part of our training. So, thank you, Bruce. Okay, thanks, Cherie. Bye bye. Over and out, everybody. Good night. Thank you for coming along.